Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mary Kennedy. I'm the founder of Biotech Networks, and I'm just here very briefly uh, to get things going. We had a little spam issue on the LinkedIn event, um, but we got that taken care of. So um, thank you all for coming on this uh, afternoon. And so I just wanted to go through a little bit of housekeeping. So uh, the, from three to four, we'll have the employee resource group or the ERG panel. And then from four to six, you'll have the choice of uh, either going to ERG themed networking sessions where you'll be able to talk about different topics. And we'll have more on that um, uh, as it starts. Or you can do speed networking and you can easily go um, between the two. And then if you have any questions throughout the event, um, on the left, you'll see uh, a menu item that says reception and you can get more details about everything that's going on and also see what's live. And also on the left menu, if an item has a red alert on it, then you know that that's live. And then we'll also guide you through the chat on the right. And um, you can actually start chat chatting now and say, hi, um, there's a stage chat and then there's a, an event chat. And then also if you are uh, at a session, there'll be a chat. But um, we think that the interface is pretty uh, straightforward. So you should be able to figure it out. So um, I'm very happy to work with uh, Lola Adeyemo on this event. So she organized the panel and she is the founder and, and CEO of EQI Mindset. And I'll just do a little introduction of her. So she is a, a team optimization and employee resource group expert. And she's also a speaker focused on life sciences and biotechnology. She has an educational background in biochemistry and biotechnology. And so before she moved to full-time consulting and speaking, she spent 13 years in different roles within operations, procurement, and DEI, which is something you hear a lot uh, today. It's diversity, equity, and inclusion within global organizations such as Thermo Scientific, Thermo Fisher Scientific, Illumina, and Becton Dickinson. And I, I can't thank her enough. Um, so also I'd like to thank Vertex Pharmaceuticals, uh, which is sponsoring this event. So we're very happy to have them. I'd like to also make a shout out to Meredith Fiddler, who helped us to work with Vertex in order to get this sponsorship. And so what we did in lieu of um, speaker honorariums is we are donating $100 to each of the charities below. So we've got Out in Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics, Smile Train, Mana to North County, San, San Diego, and Science Club for Girls. So thank you so much to Vertex. And so we've got here today Adila Creamy, who will be on the panel, and she will also be giving a short introduction to the diversity and inclusion uh, programs at Vertex. And I'll also give Adila a short introduction. So um, she is an experienced global digital leader bridging business and technology in the pharmaceutical industry, currently focused on the commercialization of cell and gene therapies. She's also committed to growth and advancement of women in science and technology and currently serves as the Boston co-lead for IWILL, the Vertex Women's Resource Network. So with that, um, let me switch over. And um, Adila, um, feel free to get started. Yeah, right. thank you. Thank you so much, Mary. And thanks to um, Biotech Networks for inviting us to join this discussion. It's, it's a really great topic. I love speaking about um, the employee resource networks and hopefully the audience will get something out of today. Uh, so I work at Vertex Pharmaceuticals, like Ver uh, Mary um, just mentioned. And if you go to the next slide, please, Mary. Um, so if you're not familiar with us, we're a bio global biotechnology company uh, really focused on getting to the heart of diseases and rare diseases and other um, areas where we focus on really patient care. The patient is the center of what we do here at Vertex. And, you know, we have to, as the, as the bullet point states, we have to, you know, 
stay up one night or sleep a little less or, you know, work another day, we're committed to it. We're really committed to our patients. And if you've heard of us, um, you know that we've really been focused on cystic fibrosis. Uh, we have a leading treatments in that um, disease area. And now we're expanding into cell and gene therapy, which is really exciting. We really think what's coming up is um, going to be a game changer for people suffering from uh, multiple diseases. Next slide. Uh, just some quick facts about Vertex Pharmaceuticals. It was founded in 1989 and we're headquartered in Boston, which is where I'm from. Um, we're also, we also have an international headquarters in Paddington um, in the UK. And our current CEO is uh, Reshma Kal Kalo Romani. Um, she has been uh, previously our chief medical officer and, and now really excited to have her as our CEO. And we are global. As you can see, we have multiple locations worldwide. Uh, next slide. Um, so with all the science and technology and exciting innovation at Vertex, we're really still very focused um, today on our Vertex culture and going forward. And we really wanna be a company where talent comes from diverse, the best talent I should say, comes from diverse backgrounds and they wanna work at Vertex um, because of that. You know, We really sponsor that. And we have a newly formed inclusion, diversity and equity group uh, that we started about uh, a year ago. And complementary to that is our employee resource networks. Um, so we both work together to promote and advocate diversity and inclusion at the company. And I am part of uh, what's called I Will, that stands for Inspiring Women in Leadership and Learning. And it's a uh, something that was the first one. We I was actually on the founding member, uh, one of the founding members of I Will, and we started in 2016. And since then, um, we've had multiple ERNs grow from it. Um, next slide. Before I talk about our ERNs, I do want to spend some time talking about our ID&E strategy. Um, so inclusion is, it's a culture where each employee has a, a sense of belonging. Um, they're valued, their ideas are welcomed, um, everyone has a voice. And we're a diverse culture as well. Um, we come from many different communities, many different areas of life, um, but everyone's respected for you know who they are and where they come from. And equity, we all are also focused on equity. So we have a balanced representation and fair treatment. Everyone has equal opportunity at our company. So these are the three pillars that you know we we support as part of the ERNs and the company as a whole. The next slide, please. Um, so as I talked about, I'm I'm part of I Will, and that's the uh, Inspiring Women in Leadership and Learning. And it's it is created for women. We are definitely. We want to be the employee of choice for women where they can you know, achieve their potential, the fullest potential, have career satisfaction. But we also talk about allyship. Um, you know, we, the programming and content we put forward is not really just for women, it's for everyone at the company. And as I said, we started in 2016. And since then we've had other ERNs kind of inspired by us and, and, and take off, which is exciting to see. Um, so I have some of them listed here. Uh, one is Brave, that is um, an ERN for uh, our first responders and our our veterans, our armed forces veterans, and we want them to feel, you know, life sciences, pharmaceutical is a great place for them to have a career. Um, a lot of the skills and uh, learnings they have from being in the armed services, we feel like can translate nicely into uh, the pharmaceutical industry. So we want to attract that kind of talent. Uh, Pride, that is our LGBTQ community and their allies. And, you know, we want to definitely invite them to be part of the Vertex community, thrive here, have, you know, opportunity, leadership positions, and VIBE, which stands for Vertex Includes Boundless Ethnicities. So across the board, you know, different ethnicities and, um, you know, trying to uh, drive innovation by building a globally racial and ethnically diverse community. So we are all allies to each other and very excited that we're seeing this ERN network grow at Vertex. And next slide, please. And lastly, just to mention some of the programming and content that I will uh, puts forward year, year over year. Um, and this has been very successful and you know a lot of participation from the Vertex community. Uh, one of our big offerings is our mentoring circles. Uh, we have this every year where we have peer mentors mentor, mentees, I should say, and two mentors um, that work with the circles. And 
it's been extremely successful and have high application uh, numbers every year. And it's a great program at Vertex that I will sponsors. We have uh, a lot of lunch and learns, a lot of timely topics, a lot of career panels and inspirational speakers, book clubs um, and workshops and skills training like presentation skills or um, networking skills. And so, as I said, it, it's focused on women, but we definitely welcome everyone in the Vertex community to be part of that. And with that, um, I will turn it back. I think I believe turn it over to you, Mary. Thank you. Yeah, um, take it away, Lola. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Adila. And thank you, everyone. Okay, now we have the screen. All right. Thank you, everyone, for being here. And thank you for to Vertex and Adila for giving us that awesome introduction. I think we're going to jump right in to get into know everybody. Um, we're grateful that San Diego Biotech Networks is putting this together. And even though in the audience we have a mix of attendees, um, definitely having people that are not in life science or biotech. Uh, but this, uh, the, the focus of the panel was getting a representation from uh, some of the leading uh, biotech uh, life science companies um, across the region and to hear from different level of ERN um, engagement. So I'm going to invite everyone. First, I guess I have to introduce myself. Um, my name is Lola, and I'm founder of EQI Mindset. Uh, privileged to work with uh, Mary and the San Diego Biotech Network to, to put this together, and especially the panel. I'm um, happy to be here, and I will pass the ball over to Lodis to introduce yourself. Tell us who you are, your, your company, and uh, your day job. I think that's a piece we usually miss in this conversation, but it would be nice to get to know what you do by day and uh, your here in row. Thank you for that introduction, Lola. Um, my name is Lourdes Winter. I work at Nuvasive Incorporated, headquartered here in San Diego. We are um, all things spine. Um, our company makes implants, technology, neuromonitoring equipment and services um, to correct a, a variety of spinal conditions, including deformation, uh, deformities. Um, we are located around the world. We have a presence in all regions, um, Europe, Asia, Latin America, um, and in the United States where we're headquartered. We're about uh, a billion one in revenues, um, and we have about 26, 2700 employees around the world um, in 40 countries. Um, our, um, I am by day, I am a procurement specialist for our corporate procurement team, and we purchase everything that keeps um, our very large uh, metaphorical plane humming. So all sorts of services and goods that don't end up in the end product uh, used by our customers, but certainly necessary to operate the, the, the company and uh, across the business. Um, and I also serve as the global co-chair for our Women in Spine Women's uh, Employee Resource Group. Um, and I'll, I'll just give you a little bit of background. Uh, the, the DEI initiative at Nuvasive is very new. Uh, we hired a, a diversity and inclusion leader about two years ago. About the same time, uh, our first DRG was born, and that was Women in Spine. Uh, so the first two years was really um, standing up that organization. Um, a lot of focus in the first two years was on professional development. And as my co-chair, Jennifer Hester, who I wish was here, um, and I have taken the reins earlier this year, our focus has become uh, to broaden that. Um, we, we work cohesively with the DEI organization to make sure that our initiatives meet the needs of our members and our allies, but also align very closely with the DEI initiatives of the company, which are centered on really four focus areas, um, professional development, recruitment, community, and market. So we, um, we even involve our surgeons um, from time to time um, in, in terms of adding equity in, in, there are very few female spine surgeons or neurosurgeons out there. So um, that there's, a, there's a mutual benefit that happens out of that, out of that relationship. And over the last year, over the last six months, I should say, our focus has been on, um, you know, keep 
keep the programs that work in place, but then look at becoming more global, more matrixed with our with our partners outside of corporate outside outside of the U.S. Um, and then um, we went through a strategic planning session, which I'm sure we'll talk about. You know, what have we done? But um, we focused. You know, we we've, we've identified other areas that we can. Um, create value and and provide support to our our members and increase our membership. Awesome! Thank you, Lourdes, and thank, thank you, you for everything you do and for being here. All right, Joya, we we'll move to you, and I'm just going off of my screen. Sure. Uh, thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Lola. Um, so hi, everybody. My name is Joya Wu, and I am the director of DEI and TA operations at Tandem Diabetes Care. Tandem is a San Diego headquartered organization. Um, we are a medical device and diabetes technology company focused on um, innovating for people who have type 1 diabetes. So our core product is a color touchscreen insulin pump. Um, our employee base today, we're, we're rapidly growing. We're about 2,200 employees. Um, and similar to what others on the call have shared so far, our DEI um, more formalized program is also fairly new um, and has been stood up within the past year and a half. Um, Tandem is committed and dedicated to the program and is finding you know, ways in which to continue investing um, in this initiative. And one of those ways is by bringing employee resource groups to the organization. Um, so my uh, representation on the call today is very much so someone who is kind of in the thick of, of bringing these groups to their organization um, in the now um, and excited to kind of speak to the steps we've taken to do that so far and um, help just learn and, and educate others on the topic as well. Thank you, Joya, and thanks for being here as well um, and for the perspective you bring. All right, Josh, you're up next. Thank you, Lola. Uh, and just and also thanks, Mary, for giving me the opportunity to, to speak here today. Um, so I am with Thermo Fisher Scientific. I've been with them for about five and a half years now. I am a senior biosciences account manager in our biosciences division. So in that I cover sales and related support activities for our life sciences portfolio, which includes reagents, benchtop instruments, services, et cetera. And I cover accounts in Cambridge and Boston uh, where I reside. Um, so it's, it's been a long day for me. <laughs> Sorry if I'm a little slow. Um, so at Thermo Fisher, um, we are the world leader in serving science. And uh, gosh, last we're growing so quickly with um, having uh, secured more than 50% of the global COVID testing market last year. Um, so we're already more than 85,000 employees. And maybe by the end of next year, hitting that 100,000 uh, mark once we fully complete an acquisition of PPI, or sorry, PPD. And uh, we have uh, almost 6,000 R&D scientists. We have over a billion dollars that we invest in our R&D, so innovation, to, to bring new products to market, uh, and over 30 billion in revenue. And probably COVID has screwed that number up even. So these numbers are, are very fast moving target. Uh, but nonetheless, we take a uh, very serious uh, pride in our mission, which is to enable our customers to make the world healthier, cleaner, and safer. And um, of course, a part of uh, our mission uh, actually uh, recently updated was our 2030 vision, which for the first time included the word diversity in it. So that's an acknowledgement from our senior leaders. And I think really accelerated by the events of last summer, um, our, our CEO uh, has biracial children and the, the events really, I think, caused a, a reckoning internally for us and really accelerated our um, d &I initiatives. And so our perspective of diversity and inclusion at Thermo Fisher is really not just a, a sort of checkbox, something that we do. It's really at its core who we are. Um, and our objectives is to make sure that we cultivate an environment where colleagues can openly share um, their wide range of diverse perspectives um, as a result of their backgrounds um, so that uh, the environment we make is one in which differences are truly valued, one where authenticity is a state of being, and everyone feels that um, they belong to the culture and therefore can do their best work. Um, we define that belonging uh, with sort of, a, if you imagine, a, a three-way Venn diagram uh, between inclusion, diversity, and equity coming together to create a sense of belonging. In terms of our ERG, um, 
uh, journey and roadmap. Uh, so the, uh, which I should clarify, uh, we call our ERNs uh, employee resource groups or business resource groups. And uh, they were first founded in 2012 uh, with uh, additional ones coming online in 2015, 2019, and most recently 2020 with our working parents. I am the global lead of our LGBT ERG, which was founded in 2015. And uh, really, uh, the, there's over there's about ten, right? So we we cover uh, pos uh, differently abled people. We cover millennials, veterans, African heritage women, Asian, uh, data science. I said working parents already, um, and uh, so basically we we all work together to create an inclusive environment for our individual identities and to further, I, I guess, advance the mission. Um, of Thermo Fisher by creating that inclusive environment. And um, that sort of, uh, I guess, our model, and this will be the last comic because I don't want to take up too much time from the other panelists. Uh, our ERG approach is uh, based uh, on four pillars of recruiting, career development, community outreach, and communications. Um, and uh, I think we'll have some more time to, to dive into the details. So I'll, I'll pause there and let the other panelists uh, do their introduction. Thank you, Josh. That was um, really helpful. I think it, it, it. I love the way everybody kind of talked about their DEI journey and then their ERG and day job. And I know it was a lot of information. Adila, I think you already, did you talk about your day job? Uh, did I talk about it? Uh, no, I, I didn't. I just went right into Vertex and the ERG. Yeah, so I'm a, I work in commercial technology and uh, right now I'm working on helping the company with the commercialization of our cell and gene therapies or becoming the cell and gene therapies. So primarily I focus on um, the Salesforce platform. Uh, if people are familiar with Salesforce Health Cloud. Um, so we're, it's a, a platform where we coordinate uh, patient care. So uh, lead a team to help do that and work with our business partners across commercial, um, focus on patient services and uh, the care coordination uh, at treatment centers. So that's my day job. Thank you. And thanks for sharing everyone. So I think the, the second part of the question I was going to ask was, how did you get here uh, as, a, as a person? You know, what, what drives you with the ERG you join? And I know a, a couple of you kind of already talked about it a little bit, like your journey. But is there anything you want to add as it relates to your personal like, why am I passionate about ERGs? How did I move into these? Is there anything that drives you that you can share? Um, Joya, you want to start? Absolutely. I mean, I think, um, you know, personally, the, the passion that I have to ensuring that they're, you know, that we're giving our employees a voice um, throughout the organization and, and giving them a platform to kind of share their ideas um, is only going to help kind of drive the strategies that our organization have, have in place. And, you know, I think right now, as far as ERGs are concerned, where we're starting, and this is due to a group of women who came forward and said, hey, you know, we have a need for um, an arena for us to get together as women and share ideas and brainstorm, especially in terms of, you know, driving more women um, in our engineering and, and technology teams specifically. And, um, you know, was, was really excited when those women came forward with, with that comment because it allowed us the opportunity to kind of propel forward and bringing this group together um, to really help kind of formalize what this could look like at Tandem. Um, and as a woman myself working in, you know, a STEM environment, um, although I'm not directly within a technology group, I understand and fully support um, their mission of, of driving representation, um, but then also utilizing these groups to just give space for the conversations, give space for connection. I think Adelia before mentioned just the opportunity for mentorship and the, the networking that these groups can provide. And I think in the state that we're currently working in, where most of us are remote, we don't have the opportunity to pass one another in the hallway as we used to. So establishing those connections, especially as a new individual at an organization is much more difficult and having um, groups like this and opportunities for networking that allow that connection is just so incredibly important right now. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Joya. Um, Lourdes, do you want to talk about how you got here? <laughs> sure. So um, I am a, a Thermo Fisher alumni and so uh, I know Lola from there and now I've met Josh. Um, we never crossed paths when uh, I was there. Sorry to, that that didn't happen. Um, but um, I, I 
you know, I am I am a woman, and I'm also of uh, Cuban heritage. I have I came to this country as an immigrant, uh, as a very young child, and I grew up always being different than the children I was going to school with. Um, and so when when I was growing up, that these types of things weren't even in the vernacular. Um, you you kind of you kind of blended in, and you you tried to be more like like people you maybe didn't think like, eat like, talk like. Um, and so as I've, I've matured as a person and as I've matured in my career um, and as I've gotten um, kind of on, you know, I've come over the, the mountain and I'm on the other, other part of, the, of my career journey, I, I've been given opportunities to participate and maybe make that um, a different reality for, for people like me, um, whether they're women or whether they're Latina or whether they're women of color or whether they're, you know, any any affinity group that doesn't look like what something is is you think something is supposed to look like, and in today's world, I'm I'm not sure I can define that anymore because look at all look at all of us here. We all represent um, perhaps something that isn't that historically might not have been the majority. And so I've had I've had those opportunities. And last summer, um, I was listening to Josh talk about some of the events. I had the opportunity to participate in a racial equality task force where our leadership asked their people, asked our people to to dig deep and and come up with some some recommendations on things that they could put in place right away and over time to change the trajectory of of racial relations here at New Vasive. And so I was leading one of the, the work streams related to policies and programs. And uh, we've implemented some of the ones, that, some of the recommendations, others are, you know, are still on the roadmap. Um, following that, there was an opportunity to step up and become the global co-chair for a women in spine organization. Um, it was, you know, I, I I feel like this is a, a gift that the universe has given me um, because I, I I don't know that I'm giving these women or our members as much as they've given me. And I feel like I'm, uh, you know, it, it's a really strange dichotomy, but I, I feel like it's a gift that they have given me to be able to share my experience, but also to, um, you know, bring them along so that when they're sitting in my, you know, when they're in this part of their of their life trajectory, they can look back and, and have a different look back perspective than perhaps someone like me might have. Um, not that it was negative, but um, you know, if you if you bring the others that come behind you and and try to help them make it better and make it better for them, I feel that's the the best the best garden we can plant um, while we walk the earth. So that's that's my journey. Um, I'm in it for another year and a half. Uh, and I'm already, you know, I'm, I'm thrilled every time I get together with with um, our leadership team across the world. I have met people that, in a pandemic environment, I would have never met, and even in my day job, I would likely not have met. So just that enhancement of my orbit, and and my and their orbit of each other, and watching that manifest has been incredibly rewarding. Yeah, thank you for sharing, Lourdes. And I always like to spend time to learning about people because I understand that sometimes we just go, 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 and we do, do, do so much. It's nice to to find the person behind the mission. And, and sometimes we are surprised, really, because we kind of think we know somebody <laughs> if they are doing ERG work, especially if you're tied to a particular ERG. So I always like to hear people's stories. Um, Adila, do you have anything to share? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I uh, just being, you know, my background is not just technology, it's science as well. I actually started as a scientist. Uh, I do have a, a master's and bachelor's in biology. And, you know, I just remember trying to get papers published and, uh, you know, sending uh, my paper out for review. And, and this was before, you know, email and everything. And it would come back in an envelope addressed Mr. You know, Adila. And, you know, I just... <laughs> It, it, may, it makes you pause and think, you know, there's a lot of um, unconscious bias, right? Um, being a woman in science, you and now technology, you, you see a lot of that. And when I came to Vertex, you know, it was a very, you know, at that time it was a very male dominated 
um, environment, both in science and technology and in leadership. I, I didn't see anyone that looked that was a woman or even looked like me, right? Um, so you fast forward to now, it's amazing to see, you know, Reshma is our CEO and and the growth of women in leadership uh, at the company. And and I will, you know, as, as I said, I was one of the founding members. And um, I think a lot of the women on that panel with me felt the same way. We really, really all kind of came from areas where we just wanted to see, you know, people like us excel, right? But that what that has to be the norm. And, you know, you can't be what you can't see, right? And so um, it kind of created a band of sisters. <laughs> I hear the term band of brothers. Um, so I, I think it's kind of like a band of sisters and we've always like worked in supporting each other, um, helping other women out at the company. That mentorship program I talked about is huge. I think it's such a great success story. Um, all the women who helped make that happen and all the women who participated in it. Uh, and that's just, you know, I'm, I'm just very passionate about that because I just remember some of the things I've been through, you know, trying to, you know, per, you know, get ahead in my career and, and some of the unconscious bias I faced. And so I think, you know, we've come a long way. We definitely have a longer way to go. Um, it's great to see these other ERNs established at, at Vertex because there's other groups, you know, with dealing with similar challenges and now we're supporting each other and, and it's becoming more the norm. So I think those are the kind of the reasons I I became part of it and still, I still am part of it to today um, yeah. and will hope, you know, to be part of it going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Adila. And I saw I saw Lourdes comment about getting the Mr. Winter as well. <laughs> uh, Josh? Sure. Um, thank you. So uh, I guess my journey to get to where I am now really, I think, starts from my background uh, growing up uh, in North Carolina, uh, not the most friendly environment where I particularly grew up in North Carolina uh, to, to gay people. Um, you know, it was kind of ruthless uh, treatment in middle school and, and early couple of years of high school. Um, so I think that really motivated me to be an activist. Um, and so in uh, undergrad in Ohio, uh, did biochemistry there. Uh, I, w you know, got involved in the, the LGBT group there, um, campaigned and all that kind of stuff for, for various uh, office people that um, were running during that time. Um, that I graduated in 2009, if that helps you align to what president might have been running then. Um, and then um, uh, helped found a, a drag show, uh, the annual drag show there to raise money for HIV AIDS. And so that's sort of, but then that was a lot of work and it was, I was like, I just wanted to exist. So I just went to Cornell for grad school and um, kind of just like laid low and participated and helped the undergrads there. Um, and then uh, was active at Pfizer and then Thermo Fisher, it just sort of, I kept always having to do things. Um, you can't, I feel like after a while, you know, even if you take a break, like you always get called back and drawn in because you want to make sure that, similar to what Lourdes said, like you want to, and really everyone, just like you want to make sure that you are leaving a better path behind you than the one that you had to follow, right? Um, and so uh, at Thermo Fisher, I, had, I was a vocal person uh, at our ERG events and uh, I was tapped to say, hey, you know, you, you've been active, you should consider uh, leading the ERG. Um, and so I, I sort of I went through the application process, interview process, and that, that's sort of how um, I reluctantly got pushed into that. Um, and our model is that it is 20% of our PMD. So, um, you know, it, I guess technically it is part of my salary that I do this work, but they don't take 20% away from other things that you have obligations for. You just sort of find a way to fit it all in. Um, and I think then when I started, I, I thought really the ERGs were largely, I guess, like networking and doing um, like awareness, education panel stuff. And my perspective has shifted a lot more, uh, I guess, uh, applying a, a business development mindset to it um, just because of how critical um, ERGs and our uh, diverse perspectives are to achieving our, our goals and our mission. And I think also um, there's still so many spaces where um, I'm an ally to all the communities, but I, I, you know, my job as ERG lead for LGBT sort of leader, um, there's still a lot of space within our own company where people do not feel comfortable that they can come out, that they can be their authentic selves. And uh, I know what it's like to be in the closet and I can't bear the thought that any of my colleagues would have to endure that life. Uh, and so, you know, really trying to cultivate, really taking that sense of like belonging and involvement to the core and in every single thing that I do, 
uh, in not only a- accomplishing, I guess, my like business function, but also in the, the ERG perspective and the culture aspect is like, how am I creating a space where, you know, the, my women colleagues are, have the voice that they can speak. Actually, my division, I just want to say this and I'm getting, I'm going too long and I'm going to shut up in a second, but um, my manager, her manager, her manager, and her manager, all the way up, all women. And I think that uh, that has played a big part in um, the culture that we have. Um, it's been an incredible environment to work under. And I think that's really motivated me to um, go out and really create that culture that um, makes people feel a sense of belonging. And of course, the journey's not over. You know, our strategic plan goes like three years into the future. And I think in terms of next steps, um, really getting metrics to drive our decisions. Um, you know, we're going to have support no matter what, but uh, our case is strengthened by hard numbers. And still yet in our community, it's really hard to come by that. And I'll save that for um, additional questioning if we come back to it. Yeah. No, thank you. And I think, uh, Josh, you nicely slid us into the next question for me, which is, you know, establishing who everybody is. And I I wanted people to get that perspective of who can be a part of an ERG, who can be involved. It's you. It's everybody on this call. It's anybody that works. If you are in that space, you can stand up, raise your hand and take the lead. You can do the work. So I just wanted people to get that perspective that everybody is coming from different work background, different personal background, but you are all actively doing ERG work as part of the uh, the company DEI strategy. So that's helpful. And the next question I wanted to move to is more of your ERG. And and Josh touched on that a little bit, which is, you know, the the last two years, I, I guess I'll count it as two years now because this year is almost over. Last year was the year. And I wanted to just get an um, understanding from you. How has your ERG changed, if it did, in the last two years? What are the challenges? What is something you want to highlight from the last two years that is going to propel you into 2022? Um, So, um, Adila, do you want to start? Yeah, definitely. I I think um, everyone being remote actually allowed us to reach to uh, reach out to more people, reach out globally. Um, before, you know, we had events, they're really local to our sites. And something I didn't mention, um, for I Will, we uh, have co-leads at every single site. Um, so we have one in international in our Paddington office, um, Oxford in our research facility in Oxford, UK, San Diego, we have one. And then, you know, Boston, I co-lead with uh, Gina LaCortia. And, you know, before the pandemic, we had these events, we had networking, uh, mentoring, um, but they're all sort of siloed within our site. And because, you know, everyone was remote, people could access Zoom. We had events now globally and mentoring circles opened up globally. And it, it really, I think it's it's strange. It really like kind of connected us more ever than ever so than before. And I think that was the first year, but I would have to say with now in the second year of the um you know, the situation, it's, I can definitely think there's Zoom fatigue. People are, are pretty, you know, wary of being on the screen all the time. And, you know, we've, we definitely still have great participation and we have, you know, um, lots of excitement to still be on the ERG, but I think there's definitely a need to get back into person. And I think people are, are starting to crave that more and more, and, and we're starting to slowly come back um, to be on site at Vertex. So I think we have to kind of navigate both situations. You know, we want to keep that momentum going with reaching out globally, but, you know, still have those smaller types of connection type meetings. So I think that's, it's going to definitely transform our ERNs once again. Um, but I think that will be a welcome change. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, Adila. Yeah, um, Lotus? Yes. Um, I was listening to Adila speaking and it was a, a little bit of deja vu. So um, like everyone, we, we had, we had a, a widely scattered organization, uh, you know, we have our corporate core team, we call it, and then we have what are called global chapters um, within our manufacturing site, our distribution site, our auxiliary businesses, and then our regions. And um, during um, during COVID, one of the things that the uh, prior leadership team pivoted to very quickly was a concept known as Free Form Friday. And uh, it is really, uh, it, it just took off because people were yearning for human contact and they were yearning to have a, a, a safe space and it became topical. Um, we've had events, you know, um, surrounding racial equality, Juneteenth. Um, we celebrated a pride event. Um, uh, 
caretakers, people who were, we had one I'm working remotely. So it, it's either listening to a podcast or having um, panel speakers like similar to this to talk really openly and freely about issues that are relevant to, to the community that we, that we serve. So that was really the, the box that we added and, and um, enhanced for 2020. Uh, in 2021, as the new team took over, we spent four days conducting a strategic planning session with all of the leadership team members from all of the GCLs. We did it over a course of four uh, sessions. And we tried to uh, toggle the time so that it would be time friendly to people in other regions, especially in, in Asia. And um, we came up with a strategic plan that we presented to our CEO in June of this year. So. I think that was a, a real um, wonderful experience for me as a co-chair. One of the, the things that my, my other co-chair and I are looking is to have the members of the leadership team who are all, you know, at different stages of their career, but certainly more fledgling and, and newer in their careers, have an opportunity to, to show the work they're doing in their respective areas of focus, which is L&D, marketing and communications, finance, and uh, events and they can show what areas that they're focusing on and then finally the third thing that we we added in addition to you know some additional programs over the ones that we were offering is to make this more matrixed so that if someone is doing something at a, at a chapter in europe and it's working very well um, they should be sharing it with their fellow chapter leaders or with the corporate team to leverage that learning and to you know look at what went well, what could be done differently in the future. So we've got a very, it almost if you look at our matrix, it, it literally does look like a matrix. It's vertical lines and horizontal lines, and you see that interaction. And in practice, it has started to really bear fruit in the last several months. So I would say some those are the, the some of the key areas in which uh, women's fine has has expanded. Um, I don't know if I mentioned this earlier, but we are the only ERG at Nuvasive currently. Um, there is a, a second ERG slated for uh, very soon. And um, I know that they were interviewing for, for leadership uh, roles. Uh, we do it the same way that I think Josh described, which is, you know, you apply for the role and you interview it and in, interview for it. So it is a competitive process and uh, the, uh, I believe it will be focused on, on racial equality, but um, being as we're small, you will have a lot of intersections of affinity groups within the organization. And I was really interested to uh, look at Adila's, um, that one column of the organization that are people of, of various backgrounds. I, I will take that back because I, I wonder if that would work uh, because when the smaller your community uh, of employees, um, it might be difficult to get subsections to get critical mass. Having said that, we have an incredible allyship uh, that includes men, that includes, you know, all sorts of affinity groups within women in spine. And I would expect that that would also translate into other ERGs as we as we expand our footprint there. Absolutely. No, thanks for sharing. And, and just to highlight for the audience, for anybody listening, I think it's important to understand the diversity we have here because we have Josh talking about just the wealth of experience and the evolution of the ERGs over the last um, couple of years. And I and then Lourdes talking about having only one, Adila talking about, you know, just medium time frame. And I'll go to Joya in a minute, but I, I, I really wanted to emphasize to the audience that when it comes to ERG, the size of your company, I wouldn't be intimidated by what it seems like a lot of people have done. I would say you need to, you know, um, start from where you are. So um, that's that's the key takeaway from all of this. There's a ton you can do, but it's a journey. It's a process. And Joya, of course, right in the midst of, you know, 2020, 2021, Yes, you're launching this now. So what has, you know, the last two years, what have you learned? And is there any big takeaways for your 2022 plan? 
Sure. I mean, I think where we're at as an organization, um, just to kind of reiterate, is we've really been spending the past year and a half kind of defining what the DEI strategy is and how that aligns with who we are as a business. Um, and part of that being our DEI council being really just a huge point, a, a, a place where we go for feedback often on this topic, um, really kind of aligning what those pillars of the council are going to be as well. And as we're now entering into ERG formation, it's really ensuring that that the individuals who are involved in these ERGs are, are, are aware of um, kind of those strategies and um, the pillars that they can, the work that they're doing can kind of align there. And I think that's really kind of, um, you know, the, the biggest thing to, to speak to right now is, you know, there's a lot to consider when you're standing these groups up for the first time. Um, and I think we've done a nice job of kind of getting the DEI work and the foundation prepared so that these groups can now kind of align themselves to, to that. But, you know, we're, we're doing things such as, okay, what is budget going to look like? Um, you know, what is our charter going to look like? Just being able to provide the guidance to the employees who want to start these groups, um, just giving them the tools that they need in order to get them off the ground. What does leadership look like? What are the commitments for those leadership um, members who are going to be sort of the leads of these groups? Um, so it's really taking the time to kind of define all those things. But then alongside of that, allowing the women um, in tandem ERG to continue flourishing and doing what they need to do to not stall their efforts. So they've been um, just wonderful and kind of informing all of these foundational items that we need to put in place in order for this to be successful. Um, and I would say just as we head into next year, and, and especially for someone who might be on the call today, who's in a position where you're thinking about bringing these groups to your organization, or maybe you're in the thick of it, I guess my biggest sorry, my watch is talking to me. My biggest takeaway um, would be that, you know, leverage the resources around you. Um, I think, you know, you need to be open to feedback. I mean, Lola, I've reached out to you for, you know, advice on things. Josh, um, you know, I scheduled a call with you. I mean, I've been trying to make use of the resources around me just to understand how other organizations are doing this. Um, and what I found in that is there's no one way, right? People are doing this very differently um, and being open and vulnerable enough to know that, you know, you're, you're not going to have all the answers. It's okay to reach out to your network to get some of those um, insights um, and just, you know, make sure that you're leveraging the expertise of people around around you. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thanks for sharing that um, about your journey, especially being brand new and just all the different areas. And I think th the life question that we just got is actually aligned with some of the questions we got uh, that I pulled into the two categories that you touched on. One of them is budgets. So we got some questions around budget. And the second question was around leadership and commitment. So we had people, I, I just kind of pulled the question into those two categories. I would like everybody to sort of address that. We had people asking about budget. What's your experience? How do you set the budget? Do you give every ERG a different budget based on um, the number, the members? Or do you have a set budget um, for your ERGs? And then the second question is around uh, the people that are leading. So I know Josh made a comment around you know, he was approached and then he applied, you know, how is your organization taking that um, passive or active role in getting people to actually lead? And, you know, if what if you have somebody that you put there and they don't really, they're not passionate about it or they don't want to do it, you know? So leadership and budgets, if uh, Josh, if you want to start, if you have insight of any of those two, and then we do a round table and do another final because I'm keeping an eye on the clock. <laughs> Sure. Um, yeah. So uh, all of our ERGs, there's ten of them. We get sixty thousand dollars each uh, that the global lead can share, can like use it discretionarily. Um, and the, uh, but that doesn't mean that like at the individual site base level, um, we actually encourage the bulk of the ERG spending at the site chapter level uh, to be covered by site sponsorship. So site executive sponsor, site leadership, et cetera. Um, and then if there are specific cases where they don't have budget for it, then the global budget can be leveraged. And really my budget is more for like external partnerships and like bigger ticket items like that, you know, pride swag, et cetera. Um, our, our leadership is, and the budget is, is in flux. Um, and I would just encourage everyone, like if you, whatever budgets, like make sure it's defined how much you have and make sure that the process for submitting invoices is as facile as it possibly can because 
because I'll just, you might be able to infer from my body language that my process currently is not facile. Um, so, and then in terms of uh, structure, um, uh, we have uh, our global leads and each of those global leads have an executive sponsor, which is on our like senior leader. So like like mine, for example, is the VP of Thumb and Fisher. He deports directly to the CEO. So like there's very high level engagement and like, and, like I guess support of the ERGs. Within each of the ERGs, then we have pillar leads and that is uh, mirrored at the chapter level usually. Um, and then for a bigger, more, I guess, uh, robustly organized ERGs, like our women's ERG, which is the oldest and most high number of members. Um, they even have like regional sub leaders, but also a lot of the structures because of our scale, you know, so don't be uh, overwhelmed if you're, you're not, if you don't have 85,000 colleagues to support such an organization. Finally, we have, um, you know, individual divisions within Thermo Fisher, um, which lead to different business functions. So we have a DNI, we have a VP of diversity and inclusion. We have a DNI director who works directly with the ERG leaders. And then we have uh, DNI directors for each of the individual divisions to drive divisional, um, I guess, DNI initiatives. Um, that latest one is a very, is like a, a new development for this year. Um, yeah, so lots of organization and and which is good because there's a lot of work to do. Yeah, absolutely, and that's that's a great perspective too on the structure, especially for large companies. Because I know you've been talking about leading and all of these structures for the size of the company. I think it was it was good clarification. Um, Adila, do you have anything to add on budget and a leadership structure? Yeah, um, budget. So we um, every year, Gene has a set budget. I think it's a pretty similar number to what Josh described, and um, and there is allocation per site, right? And so that's um, it's kind of decided on the leadership level of our company uh, what our budget is. Uh, in terms of like leadership in the ERN or ERG, sorry, um, it, it's all of its volunteer. So uh, you know we have um, we have like the co leads of I will where sort of tapped to do it, but it's, you know, a lot of it is you join the IWIL steering committee and then, um, you know, then, you know, your name kind of comes up in conversation and you're kind of tapped to lead. But then we have, you know, different sort of goals that we, that we push forward and, and I will it's partner give and um, empower, and we have leads for those. So people t stand up and they, and they want to do it. Um, sometimes we ask certain in individuals who we know have been great contributors to it and, and a lot of times we hear yes. I mean, people are just are, are really are really great about volunteering to do it. So a little bit different from what Lourdes, um, what you've described as an interview process. I, I thought that was really interesting. Um, but everything here is is really on the volunteer basis. Yeah, thank you, Adila. Um, Lourdes, do you have anything to add about budget and leadership? Uh, sure. Um, it, we get our we get our uh, budget allocation from. Um, right now, the uh, DEI is part of the HR organization, so it flows through them. Uh, being as we're currently the only um, ERG, we've gotten the entire um, ERG budget. Um, as as new as new ERGs come into play, it will remains to be seen if, the, if that's going to be subdivided because it's pretty generous, and it's I would say it's a little bit larger than what I've heard here. But there may be some sharing to be done, um, but time will tell. Um, it's interesting because we have a finance leader within our corp, our, our ERG leadership team. So she she happens to work in finance, and she works very closely with with our finance team to you know facilitate some of the the invoice payment and and vendor management and being in procurement. I I, I see both sides of that equation now as a user and as a facilitator of that. So. Um, it was interesting to hear Josh talk about um, invoice payments, um, but uh, the 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 process is is we we control our budget and as you know and we we get requests from the chapter leads. There are some locally funded events and uh, initiatives. There's some cost sharing, especially when it's um, outside market facing. We have events that we want to invite our surgeon partners that have to do, there's some co-branding that happens and uh, sometimes some, some funds are, are contributed by the business and as well as at the site level. Um, and then from a leadership standpoint, I think I mentioned earlier, we have a direct line to the CEO of the company, which in my life, I've never been in front of a CEO. So to have that level of engagement from him and then to have our CFO, 
um, come to to Pride events and to sit, you know, we have these Reform Fridays and you've got people from the C-suite sitting in there in that in that conversation um, and, and, you know, sharing their notes and sharing their talks. We have events called uh, Speed Networks and um, and growth groups. And usually those are our members speaking to members of the leadership team on topical issues. So there, it'll be a panel event like this, and then you break out into, into breakout rooms and you're talking face-to-face -face with a leader. What does that do? It gives our, our members an opportunity to have FaceTime with somebody they might never do, otherwise do as part of their day job because they sit in a, in a role or in a site that they don't have that opportunity. So um, it, it, that is, is bridging the gap between top levels of leadership and levels before, and then people all the way. We do have opportunities to improve that, especially for our manufacturing and distribution um, members, because they are at a machine or they are in a, you know, in a situation where they're producing or delivering, or, you know, sometimes some of our, our members are in operating rooms with the surgeons uh, doing neural monitoring during surgeries. So they may not be able to participate in these things. So as we create new uh, new engagements and that and whatnot. We we try to consider that audience and how can how can we provide them opportunities, to, uh, similar opportunities as people who work in an office get. Yeah. No, thank yeah. Thanks for sharing that. And if I heard anything from your comment, I think it's if you're setting up your new year, you find a finance person. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> to Absolutely. be on the team, right? <laughs> you you want to get the money, and then you want to be able to use the money as quarters roll on, right? Um, every yeah. every publicly held company works on a quarterly basis, and so you want to make sure you still have that, and that you can use it all the way to the end of the year. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Okay, so I'm keeping an eye on the clock and we have about five minutes. We could probably go to a little bit, six, seven minutes. So two things. I like what Josh just did, but I think you put it in the wrong job. If any of the panelists, if you want to share your LinkedIn link, if you are open to people contacting you, because I think we're not going to be able to do Q&A on the live stage. But the good news is um, we end the, li the stage live but we are going to go into the left side of your screen. There's uh, what we call sessions. It's like networking round tables. So you'll be able to join um, the off mic and you're going to have the panelists. Um, uh, some people are going to only be able to stay for a little bit, but you have an opportunity to engage with the panelists, with Mary and myself and ask specific questions. Um, when you get into those rooms, those, you see the rooms labeled. So you'll be able to join which one you want. Oh, thank you, Mary. So these are the groups, um, the sessions that are going to be available in four minutes. It should be flashing on your screen now. You can hop around. You can jump onto one room, move into the next room, or you get a chance to come off mic and actually ask questions um, as it applies to your, your ERGs. But for the, for the panelists, you can also, I'm volunteering their time on top of all the jobs they have, <laughs> but you can also find them on LinkedIn. Um, if you have specific questions, um, I, I know people hit me up on LinkedIn all the time, but it's usually better if you have a clear question to ask it up front, not, not, not necessarily just asking to meet, but asking clear questions that they can help you answer. So thank you all for being here today. But before we wrap up, I think I would give everybody a chance to sort of, based on your ERG experience, based on where you are with your company right now, for anybody in the audience that is thinking about starting an ERG, if your company doesn't have an ERG, you're thinking about starting, if you have an ERG, you haven't joined, um, depending on where you are on your journey, um, if I could just go around the room and have you um, share some advice for them from your perspective and your ERG experience. Um, so I will start with you, Joya. Um, I guess I'll just reiterate what I said earlier. Um, what I have found most valuable throughout this entire experience so far has been kind of leveraging the resources and just the wealth of knowledge around me. The people who, you know, have various levels of experience in these groups, who've done it before, um, who can help kind of inform, you know, the the way in which we're we're moving forward. And again, everybody's experience is going to look a little bit different. And ultimately, at the end of the day, you're going to have to determine the the best fit for your own organization. Um, but that that would be my biggest tip. Thank you, Joya. Um, Josh? Oh, gosh. I think uh, my parting wisdom would be to, 
to get engagement and support from your leaders, you know, you really need them to help drive your strategy. Um, and once you secure that, then you need to go and get support from all the other people that you can. Don't try and do everything yourself. You need to uh, influence others to help achieve your mission. So don't do it all. You'll you'll run yourself ragged. I'm already ragged. Get <laughs> other people to help you achieve your goals. <laughs> Thank you, Josh. Adila. Yeah, I think that's some um, really great advice, Josh, and definitely get sponsors. And we, you know, one thing I didn't mention is that we have two great sponsors, um, one sitting on the executive committee of our company and one is uh, the head of research. Um, so it's it's really great to have both of them and we get a lot of benefit from that. And um, also advice, just, you know, enjoy the, the camaraderie and the networking that you get out of it. I think there's a lot of great initiatives you can push forward and push through, but it's really the connections you make and, and, and make the most of that. You know, I think that's um, it's great to get that support as you're growing your career. So those are my two pieces of advice. Thank you, Adila and Lourdes. Yes, um, echo both Josh and Adila. I, I would, um, one of the things I was lucky to receive as, as I took um, this role was there is, we have um, what is going to be morphed into an, a diversity council. So it's, it's formed of business leaders from um, you know the, the upper levels of the organization, not just the C-suite, um, to whom we report what we're doing. So they're hearing from us and they're also getting feedback from us. So I think that's one way of getting uh, sponsorship. Um, and then uh, keep telling your story. Um, tell it to your members, tell it to the people that, that make decisions in the company and show, you know, you want to show what you're doing for the people, but at the same time, in terms of a employer brand proposition for people, people are going to want to come and work at a place that has people that look like them, that are like them. And so to the extent that you can publish that in the outside world, be it through your social networks or using your, your company's communication channels, um, we have a member on our leadership team who's our Mark on. Uh, expert and she she does that um, she she works with the branding team to get that story out so uh, that is another another way to 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 be successful is to continue to tell your story because you're doing good work and you want people to know about that that attracts new members attracts new people to your company and it brings in new ideas and perspectives and since this is all about diversity and bringing those perspectives in what better way uh, to cast a wider net yeah. No, thank you. Thank you so much to every one of you. It's been so amazing to hear you all talk. I'm glad, you know, we have people and we captured these. Um, I, I look forward to just um, some of your insights to help to share it. So one thing, I shared the link on the chat. I um, lead a group called Cross Company ERG on LinkedIn. And we meet first Friday of every month at 10 a.m. to 11 a.m., uh, PST. So if you want to join the LinkedIn group or um, join the call, it's sort of like a ERG for ERGs. It's a community for ERG members, leaders, advocates. Every month we have a theme, but it's basically a space for you to come meet the ERG members, ask your questions. It's actually tomorrow because tomorrow is the first Friday of the month. And our theme for tomorrow is going to be around ERG strategic planning. So we have an ERG that is going to come showcase how they did their strap planning for next year and what, they, what are some of the things that came out of their strap planning session, some of the tools they used. So that's sort of what the group is about. People join from all over different industry, different companies and share. People ask questions. Some people are just new. They just want to learn about ERGs. So it's a space for you to connect, find resources, network and learn. If you're interested, join uh, the group on LinkedIn or connect with me and I'll provide the details. I also do ERG consulting. So if you are an ERG member and you're looking for insights, it's free to sit with you and just kind of look through your data and help you figure out where you need to be to, to take things to the next level. So happy to connect with anybody and uh, thank you everyone for being here. Hopefully you can stay on for a couple of minutes to get some questions on the sessions before you have to jump off, especially Adila and Josh. <laughs> yeah, I know. Apologize, I do have to run. But thank you so much. Um, thank you, Adila. Yeah, it worked. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. All right.
everybody. Let's up uh, all the rooms have a facilitator. So see you all in the session rooms. Bye. 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 Thank you.